Shall we finally begin the panel discussion as well? Let's bring on board our speakers. And uh, well, this time we're talking about a very interesting topic, active or passive, what makes sense? A very, very important question on all our minds. Let me quickly bring on board our set of speakers. First up, if I may please invite Koel Ghosh, head of South Asia, SNP Dow Jones Indices, to please come on the stage. Leading the regional uh, commercial efforts and actively educating and advocating for passive investing. Her previous experience in the asset management and financial industries add to her in-depth knowledge in that space. Joining her, may I also please invite Navneet Munot, Managing Director and CEO, HDFC Mutual Fund, who comes with a rich experience of more than 28 years in the financial markets. Well, our next speaker is Samir Desai, National Lead ETF Retail, Nippon Life India Mutual Fund, who comes with a prolific experience of more than 30 years in capital markets in areas such as institutional equity sales, private wealth management, independent financial advisory group, ETFs, and indexing. Our next speaker is Swaroop Mohanty, CEO, Mire Asset Manage Mutual Fund. And he comes with over 27 years of experience in the field of financial services, including 20 years plus in the asset management sales. And spearheading the panel discussion, once again, we have with us none other than Prem Khatri, founder and CEO, Cafe Mutual. So on that beautiful note, I'm going to Hi, hand it over welcome, to you. Samir. Welcome, Samir. Thank you for having us. So it's good to ha uh, have a, on my panel uh, people who, like Navneet, Swaroop, Samir, whom I've actually known the briefest, but whom I have a lot of, his passion for passives is something to be really admired. And Koel, whom I've actually known the longest in this group. <laughs> so uh, good to have all of you here with, with us. Uh, throughout the day, we've been deliberating on issues which are related to passives. But a very important question comes on everyone's mind, that given the fact that India is supposed to be an active market, where most of the funds, active funds, are outperforming the respective benchmarks most of the time, why do we need passives? So I will go with you, Navneet, first. You run India's favorite fund house, as far as equities are concerned. So this is a question that I think no one's better qualified to answer than you. So the app title would have been active and passive, not active or passive. I don't think in India we have reached a stage where we have to make a choice between these two. I think both will coexist, both will complement each other, and there is tremendous opportunity for both to grow together. In India, a large number of people are yet to meet the market. Most of them would have the aspiration to beat the market, and as you rightly mentioned, that industry has got a great track record of beating the market that will continue, and that's why I feel extremely uh, positive on the future of active management, notwithstanding all the discussion in the uh, global markets and the global asset management industry. I feel very positive about the potential of Indian managers to generate alpha. In fact, we can discuss uh, during the conversation uh, why I feel positive about active management, even globally, where for last several years people have been hearing that a large number of active managers are, are underperforming. Why I feel so positive about a big coming back of, of active managers globally. Uh, but, but, but that aside, I think last year, we, I mean over the last two years, we saw debt accounts going from almost like 4 crores to 9 crores or so. We also saw the uh, number of unique pairs in the mutual fund industry going up by like 1.2 crores, we saw almost 60 lakh pen out of this 1.2 or so, 60 or 70 lakh pens getting added to the mutual fund industry who have ETFs. And only 15 lakhs of them have some other products. So industry has added roughly 50 or 60 lakh new unique pens who only have ETFs. Maybe these are the people who believe in do it yourself. They have been trading in the equity market or investing directly or uh, participating in the equity market and also looking at ETFs. There could be some other investors also who are looking at the ETFs as a passive uh, way of like entering the market. But at the same time, the growth of active was much higher than the growth of passive and I don't see that changing for a very, very long period of time. Uh, in terms of the assets, like in the, on the fixed income side, it was close to zero five years back. 
Now it's almost 8% of the AUM is, is on the passive side on equity from zero, from let's say three or four percent. Five years back, we've come almost to 16, 17%. Of course, a large part of that is thanks to the provident funds and some of the institution mandates, but even otherwise, the retail interest has been increasing, and I'm sure that will continue to increase, and there should be like all choices available with the investors to the way they want to express their views or the way they want to participate in the market. But I feel very positive about active as well as uh, passive growing together. And of course, the, the, the regulatory development over the last few years has helped both the categories. I mean, you look at the active whether the classification, total return index, I think now that the uniformity in the, in the index also, which we use as a benchmark for each category, so on and so forth, and of course on the, on the uh, uh, cost structure, etc. But at the same time, passive, there are huge number of, of uh, reforms that are happening and the innovation that has been brought by various industry players. So I feel very positive about both and they will coexist. Okay, Swarup, you know, uh, two years back when we had met, uh, you had surprised me completely by talking about ETFs as a priority for Mire. Uh, this was at a time uh, where your performance was the talk of town. Your performance has been consistent. It has been across the board. You've grown on the back of your performance in active funds. Why were you talking about ETFs then? Uh, Prem sir, so, first of all, passive. thank you for having me and it's great to be back to the physical world. I uh, see it's always natural that when an active fund manager starts talking passive, these questions come. But just to take on from what uh, Navneet said, it's actually a fantastic time to be in India both as an asset manager, as an investor and as a distributor or an advisor. Here's the thing, uh, now finally when you look at asset management, it's a business of the benchmark. Uh, the active manager will try to outperform the benchmark. In that process, there comes a downside risk. And there is the other side of the market which buys the benchmark, which is the absolute return of the market. Now, there will be funds on those sides in the form of index or ETFs. We've chosen the ETF route because we feel it's closest to the market and, and that's where we stand globally. But when it comes to the investment requirement, uh, we made a deviation on the debt side by giving the SDL index because we feel that's the right product to have at this moment in the market. But as an asset manager, I am not the person to choose what is right for the investor. It is for the distributor, advisor, and the investor to choose what is right for the investor. And then, like Navneet said, there is enough talent in India which will go out and demonstrate an alpha generating possibility. At the same time, there will be enough new investors who will come and say, let me first buy the market, understand the nuances of the market, and then probably graduate to active. Some of them may not graduate to active. The point I'm making is, as an asset manager, I am not the chooser. Asset allocation happens at your end, and our job is to give you a good product. When we come with an active fund in front of you, our aspiration should be to beat the benchmark. And then that's a question which Coel should answer. I'm not the right person on that to answer. But if we demonstrate that capability, which the industry is still demonstrating, active business is live and kicking. But at the same time, the demography of the country is changing. The requirements of every investor is changing. And as we graduate from what, we, what I call a very tactical sort of purchase from one product to the other to a wholesome portfolio uh, uh, construction perspective, there is a position for both of them. And, and I feel at this moment a combination of an active and a passive because let's face some facts that with the categorization of funds, there are that many active funds we can bring to the table. But with passives, the beauty of passive is wherever there is an investable universe, you can form an index. And with an index, you can form a fund. And there are, with factors, innumerable possibilities of that fund. So ideation is live and kicking on the passive side. So what will come from the passive side is very differentiated from, from the active at this moment. So when you combine the two, as an asset manager, I would love to be on both sides, and that is our aspiration, okay. to build two solid businesses on either sides of the business. OK. Samir, you were talking about some study that you've done on the outperformance of active funds. What does your study say? Yeah, thank you, Prem, for uh, inviting me. I think the fact that we are having a passive conference shows that passive has uh, arrived in India. And I think it is increasingly occupying the uh, center stage. And I can say this because being ex-benchmark, 
okay, I know these struggles that were there in passive and the sea change that I see now. I am reminded of Jason Zweig who once said that alpha has always been perishable but in today's world of instantaneous information, it has the shelf life of unrefrigerated fish. Are Indian alphas perishable? Very much. I think Indian alphas are increasingly transient, perishable, short-lived, and they are changing hands. And let me, uh, you know, uh, quote some analysis that we keep doing all the time. There are almost 16,000 registered entities in India who are in the business of generating alpha. Okay, all your AMCs, uh, insurance companies, AIFs, PMSs, FBIs, Brokers. and so on and so forth. Yeah. Okay, uh, I'm not including pension funds, treasuries, family offices, who are also doing the same thing. Take an average of five professionals per entity, all those brilliant CFAs, CAs, MBAs, fighting with each other in the boxing ring, in the zero-sum equation, trying to generate alpha. Okay, so in an increasingly professionalized market, if a few managers outperform, the others are going to underperform by default. And that reminds me of William Sharp, who wrote the paper, Arithmetic of uh, Active Management, way back in 1990. Sharp's observation was that mathematically, it is impossible for everybody to generate alpha. Okay, so as the market increasingly professionalizes, if few generate alpha, the rest have to uh, underperform. And Indian markets are efficient, they are increasingly resembling, and I can explain uh, zero sum using the analogy of Mumbai's local trains. In Mumbai's local trains, everybody cannot generate alpha by catching window seats. Okay, in a rush hour, which is an efficient market, just like your mutual fund industry or the Indian stock market, if some generate alpha by catching window seats, Others have to hang outside. And somebody like me who is an ETF or an index fund, I will reach my destination in a risk-adjusted fashion. The guys who outperformed and the guys who underperform, they'll keep changing all the time. And you'll know that only in hindsight. So alphas are increasingly uh, random. Okay? And data is telling us that. I think in large caps, uh, being one of the earliest users of Spiva data in India, and I'm going to take a bit from, uh, you know, yeah. Goel's uh, answer. Uh, I remember that even in uh, 2010, if I recall a SPIVA scorecard, in a five-year time period ended December 2010, 76% of large-cap Indian mutual fund managers underperformed the Nifty. Now it is even more pronounced. If you see the SPIVA data or you see any other, uh, you know, data, I think increasingly it is difficult to generate alpha Alpha is transient and it will keep changing hands. Okay, so very passionate case for uh, <laughs> passives. Samir, what is your data and this SPIVA? First of all, tell us what is this SPIVA business and yeah. what does it do, what does it track, and what the numbers are. Yeah, first of all, thanks, Prem, for having me. And it's really heartening to see a packed house to hear more about passive. And I do remember, I think, you know, I was telling somebody, maybe I was 10 years ahead of my game because 10 years back when I used to walk into asset managers, uh, you know, offices, and, you know, they used to keep telling us, you know, you're in the wrong place and you're trying to sell the wrong kind of a concept. But that's changed. And uh, SPIVA that, you know, uh, Samir mentioned is uh, Standard & Poor's Index versus Active. This is a scorecard that has been, that's gone way back in 2001. We started publishing it in in the US and now it's cut across around 11 countries. In India, of course, we're doing it for more than a decade now. And what it does is it compares, you know, how many active funds are outperforming or underperforming the benchmarks in each of the categories. So the categories that we take are large cap, mid cap, and then we take uh, some of the uh, fixed income segments as well. Now, obviously, you know, the trend that we see is not only in the global countries, but we are seeing it in India as well. Large cap as a segment, I think, has uh, reached some efficiencies, which is making active uh, difficult to outperform the underlying benchmark. Now, that was the case, and we saw it persistently happening in India, in the US, in the Europe, Brazil. Now, you know, we have reports of MENA, and we have reports in the Australia, Japan. 
You're seeing that trend across as, uh, uh, large caps, but now, surprisingly, the last two years, you would see the last two reports that we're seeing mid caps in India is a space where it's slowly and steadily, you're seeing that outperformance of the benchmark. So if you have an index which has a diversified you know, basket of stocks. You don't have the, you know, you can't have stock uh, concentration exposure. You have lower cost that you can get in via an index road. There is complete transparency. Now, as an index provider, I don't trade the product. I don't create the strategy. I just create the benchmark that represents, and I don't create the product. So the product are people like Navneet and you know, Swaroop who are creating the products for you. So for us as an index provider, we are absolutely transparent and unbiased to create these products and you know, have them out in the market. And today, what's happening is you know, market beta is something that people have you know, kind of attuned to. So they are looking at something that is better which is, you know, they're looking about smart beta, which are factor plays. So today the dialogue is moving a lot from just pure market beta exposure into broader uh, concepts, something like even metaverse, something like even cryptocurrency. Okay, okay, yeah. yeah. So you know, when, when people talk about the William Sharpie and Markovich and French, Pharma, all of those people, because the efficient market theory and uh, everything efficient frontier, everything came from Chicago Business School in the 1950s. So there is a story which goes like this, and I'm a big believer in them. Uh, there's a story that goes like this, that a professor in Chicago Business School was uh, taking a walk in the evening with his wife, and the wife sees on the footpath, there's a $10 bill lying, and she tells her husband that there's a $10 bill here. And the husband says that markets are efficient, if there was a $10 bill, somebody would have already picked it up. <laughs> there is no way there could be a $10 bill. But the wife was smart, and she looked at, I mean, looking at her information edge, analytical edge, behavioral edge, picked up the $10 note, and walked past. So I think I would be in both the camps. There is a theory, and there is a business to be built on that. But there are smart people like his wife, and we would like to do that as well. But. I, I'm not only propagating, I'm saying I'm definitely an index uh, investing propagator, but I like, you know, what Navi started off with. It's not an either and or. Why should you not have best of both worlds, right? I've been advocating core satellite for a very, very long time. I don't give in investment advice. It's basically Swarup and Navneet and, you know, Samir are the people who give. But, you know, why not include both by using active and passive? Okay, but uh, and, you and know the biggest but that Navneet, gets created that alpha is a zero sum game, and of course maybe in a market where the markets have got completely institutionalized, so there are hundred players in the room, and everybody has to generate alpha against the, each other. But look at our market, a large part of the market. So let's say half the holding is with the promoters. Now, if you know that metal prices are going to go down. Will the promoter going to sell the stake and after two years when the cycle changes or four years after the cycle changes going to buy back the stock? It doesn't happen like that, right? But somebody else can, can be against that. Large number of other investors, for example, almost one quarter of the market was owned by foreign investors, of course, slightly lesser now. I mean, you meet most of these people. Several of them are very good friend of mine. When I speak to them and I ask them, are you very negative on India? No, but I have redemption in my fund and I, he manages an emerging market equity fund, Asia Pack. Ex Japan fund or a global equity fund where there's a redemption, whatever is my allocation, I have to sell. So they get driven by a variety of other factors. Now there is a large number of other retail investors and large number of couple of other 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 set of investors. And you can generate alpha against them. You don't have to I mean alpha as someone says alpha is a zero sum game. In fact, globally also I believe that thanks to the rise of variety of things, one the ETF on one side. And of course, ESG, the way it was interpreted, on top of that, ELGO and, and the uh, program trading, and now the Robinhood investors, all put together, have created a massive opportunity for the active managers. So Fidelity doesn't have to generate alpha against capital, capital doesn't have to generate against Templeton. All of them can generate against all of these uh, people who are, I mean, th th there's a lot of opportunity getting generated for them as a class, as long as, they have uh, uh, you know, a, a proper process and, and play the, whether it's time arbitrage or research arbitrage or whatever uh, process that you are employing. Okay, but, 
the the direction is in you know direction is pre decided the fact is that uh, 20 years back the etfs and index funds were very small compared to the active funds there and then we've seen that over a period of time their share has been constantly been increasing so the direction is very clear in which case what we want to know is should we adopt it earlier or should we wait for some more time for uh, actives to underperform you know that it's a question of timing it has been decided all of us all four of us or five of us rather have decided that passives is the future but is passives the future at the cost of actives today or should we adopt them tomorrow see uh, i'll be a little honest on this one i represent a product manufacturer so i stand here pretty biased right i believe this is a room full of distributors and advisors you have to decide now if after 10 year data which coel is putting up forget large caps if one out of two mid caps are underperforming benchmark and that you realize after 10 year of investing it's already gone what is right for the investor is right for everybody and that is the fundamental basic of this business if you are going to take a call that is why i completely disagree with this painting of this brush of category all mid caps are this all small cap no a scheme will outperform the benchmark the category will not outperform that the job becomes a little tougher because as efficiencies grow the number of alpha managers will start decreasing either you have the talent of identifying who this alpha manager of the future is because it will mean shunning all biases all biases meaning all biases if one is capable of doing that please go ahead and do that then you will command a phenomenal premium in the market and that's the art suppose we are sitting here as an active manager and we don't beat benchmark over a period of time it will take just a year for this business to collapse is a reality right so as advisors you have to take a call when to act now after 10 years if you're going to act then the job is already over somebody else would have taken that cake already so be very clear about it and be very unemotional about this and act as on yesterday on the benefit of the client that's that's the bottom line yes yeah, uh, i mean see i'll say that the core part of the allocation should go to passive okay and the reason is very simple the only rate of return that you can capture going forward consistently is the index rate of return otherwise in any other methodology including smart beta you can either outperform the index or underperform the index so index the cap weighted beta is silver medal position by default outperformance is gold medal underperformance is bronze medal as the spiva data is telling us most of the folks are on bronze medal position okay 82% of large cap managers for example in 5 years time period ended december 2021 have underperformed the large cap index 58% of mid cap managers and i am quoting the spiva data and this number is higher than the us for the same time period so if we think that the that india is different it is inefficient that's not the case in fact india is uh, even more efficient uh, than the us so i think i would go for indexes in the core part of the portfolio uh, and again i'm quoting uh, an ria from the us who once said indexes are very reliable they are always working for you they don't change jobs don't demand increments bonuses don't quit jobs don't retire they are always working for you so go for something which is eternal and not ephemeral and not random okay Okay. Just a small rejoinder to what Samir is saying. Since we are starting the passive business practically at an infant level, don't make the mistakes which we did when we started the active industry of painting the brush with one one color. You know, typically when we started, and there are enough who will go back with me 15, 20 years in this room. What is a big brand is a good fund. Finally, we are starting to choose the right products. Again, there is an index. There will be an index fund. There will be an ETF fund. but find the fund which will replicate the index and etf to the narrowest that's the art don't paint it with one brush okay index fund means all index funds are good 
That's the choice that you have to make and spend some time in finding out whether it has a good market maker backing the liquidity, are there, uh, uh, the dealers skilled enough to replicate the index, if there is a deviation, what is that fund doing about it? This is the great time to understand that business. And please understand, I've been trying to understand this business for three years. I do not know why it is called passive. Running the passive business is a very active business. I feel running the active business is far more passive than the active business, uh, than the passive business. So start afresh. This is a great time to do a lot of learning. It is not an easy business. Right? Don't paint it with one brush is something which I'd like to leave behind, which is 25, 27 years of my learning of selling the active business. Okay. So we'll be uh, soon celebrating the 20th anniversary of our passive funds, index funds. So we are one of the oldest player in passive industry and a house which also has got 25 year track record of generating alpha. I mean, consistent, huge amount of alpha generation, but at the same time, passive was launched uh, thanks to the uh, wisdom and the foresight of the of the people who, who founded the AMC. So you always believed that as uh, uh, Swarup rightly said that our idea is to provide you, uh, you know, the solutions. It's up to the advisor, up to the investors to choose what really suits them, uh, where, where each product fits in. So it's not, I mean, again, I'm repeating the same point which I mentioned earlier, that it's not a debate between active and passive. I think there is scope for both. Uh, there, are, there are opportunities for generating alpha. Those investors, those advisors who think that's a right fit should do that. We launched a couple of products last year. We'll be launching large number of products next year. But it's not a because of the belief that alpha is over. In fact, I've never been as positive on alpha generation capability in the last 10 years as I am today. And I said it a year back. And look at last one year, I mean exactly a year back, there were so many stories quoting so much, so much of research that how the alpha is behind. Now there is no way, given the Twitter, the whole democratization of information, there is no way active managers can generate alpha. Uh, and whatever people show, 2025 years of track record is unlikely to, to continue. But look at last one year, I mean talking about us, anywhere between 3 to 10, 11% over the benchmark. And in India, when we talk about benchmark, it's a total return index. And when we talk about the NAV returns, I mean, it's absolutely clean and the most transparent in the world. There are no hidden costs. There are no explicit other charges. There are no commissions and the other things that, that globally you'll be, you'll be charged as an investor. It's, it's, a, it's the cleanest and the most transparent. And there, if it is anywhere between 3 to, uh, 3 to 11 percent or so last year, and I, I, I believe it's, it's likely to continue. I know, I think uh, Sami spoke a lot about the passive and you know, I know we have advocates of active here, but one of the things of uh, index investing one has to understand is there is no fund manager bias. So, you know, if you are like, you know, something where you're, you know, Sami was talking about, can you pick that fund where you're assured of that fund manager return? And you know, we do another report called the persistent scorecard. We've not done it in India, we do it in the US which shows how persistent are fund managers in repeating their performance. Now, if that aspect, in the US it's on only 27% of persistence. So I think that aspect is something that you have to consider when you're considering the active-passive debate. Like I said, it doesn't have to be either or, but when you're considering that, that's very, very important because you are then uh, having a consistent methodology. Now, one of the things that index providers do is they publish their methodology in clear script on their website. You'll find it very, very clearly there. So you know what you're expecting from, you know the strategy. When it comes to an active, maybe the reason Navneet is saying, because there are differentiation and active fund managers experience and bias can bring to the table to that portfolio. But index is where it has predictability. I will not say past returns will continue in the future, but you know that there is a there is a set formula that that index has, and it's completely transparent. So you get to know what you're getting into. OK, got the point. So one thing which has come out very clearly is that they are not substitutes of each other. They're complementary products. In passives, again, there's a split between index funds and ETFs. And uh, I have always been perplexed by why do we actually need ETFs in this country? Because ETFs, the purpose for which they are used in US markets particularly, they're more tax efficient than mutual funds. Also, there are institutions who need to take intraday calls. But for a lay person, a lay investor, is there a need to actually look at ETFs at all? 
with all their baggage, market making and inefficiency at times. Okay, so where is the where is the need for a passive? Uh, sorry, an index, and where is the need for an ETF? So. Both will grow. So in year 2000, uh, because we all quote US, US is where we have seen all this growth. In year 2000, there were around 80 odd uh, ETFs managing $70 billion in US, roughly. Uh, there were 500 odd index fund managing $425 billion in, in, in assets in year 2000. And now, I mean, 20 years later, there are 7,000 plus ETFs managing what, seven and a half, eight trillion dollars and maybe next ones are half the number. So there were 70 and 500, and now it's like other way around. The, the 7,000 and index funds are far smaller, but managing more or less similar amount of money, seven and a half, eight trillion dollars, both of them. The ETFs have grown quite a bit, but my, I think if then, then you are actually, if you are saying that active managers cannot generate alpha, I can do it on my own and I can buy index fund. If you are buying variety of these, then what you are doing? You are actually doing the same thing that you are choosing which index, which sector, which theme, which segment of the market will do better than you are trying to be an active manager and you think that the smart people with so much of resources at their disposal applying, as I said, the information arbitrage, analytical arbitrage, behavioral arbitrage, I mean the edge, uh, analytical uh, uh, informational and behavioral edge won't be able to do that, but I'll be able to do that. I think that's, then again, we are, we are not addressing the right. I think in India, both will grow, and as I said, I mean, with nine crore demat account, there'll be tremendous opportunity in the ETFs. We are launching large number of ETFs in next, whatever, few quarters. My index will also grow, and, and there is a market for that. See, I think ETF and uh, index funds are just the two passive formats. Okay, index funds are for those uh, investors who don't want a DMAT account or a trading account. But there are a large number of investors who want to uh, operate through the ETF route. So I think both have pros and cons. Uh, Real-time pricing does have its pros. Uh, at the same time, if somebody doesn't want to uh, operate through the capital markets route and the mutual fund route, uh, then I think the uh, index funds are uh, okay for those investors. But in India, we have uh, demand for both. So I think it is important to offer both the uh, you know, formats uh, to the investors. And one uh, uh, more thing I'd like to add is that asset allocation, which is a very important principle, can be practiced efficiently only with passive. Indexes are asset class representative portfolios. Individual managers, stocks cannot represent an asset class, okay? So you have to have indexes to practice asset allocation efficiently. There are enough indexes available in equities, sectors, fixed income, and commodities in India to construct portfolios. I'll just echo from uh, Samir, one of the reasons we are fully invested on our active side is to enable the distributor, the advisor to allocate prudently. We don't take cash calls. If you give us money to buy equity, we will buy equity, saying that it is actual representation. But to answer the question, Prem sir, it is up to the investor. And I believe there are three different investors at this moment in India. There could perpetually remain with these three. One who believes that I want that alpha over return, a market over return, that's an active investor. The other one who is saying in this pursuit of alpha, I don't want to miss the beta which is the market return. Post-COVID, mutual fund will no longer remain the domain of non-DMAT holders. Traditionally, I've heard this instance number of times that, are udhar kyun karna hai, udhar DMAT khulna padta hai. Now, DMAT account opens in a click of a button. So that environment is vanished. Now, when you get it to the DMAT account, if you look at the last 200, 220 trading uh, uh, sessions in the country, there have been 80 days when the market has closed 1% above the low. 1%. So if you want to get near to the market, then ETF is your uh, product. Because it could close 1% lower also. See, the one thing that one has to realize with ETFs is the entire market risk is passed back to the investors totally. That's something one has to realize. There's no filter on that. But somebody will say, okay, okay, I don't want a DMAT account, so the index fund is there for them. And there should be choice. More the choice, better for the investors. Now, when it comes to the debt part of the business, most of the new funds are coming on the index part because there is a certain liquidity part 
that needs to be addressed. Now, by choice, the industry feels that on the debt side, especially on the corporate bond fund, it is better to be on the index side of the product rather mm -hmm. than the uh, ETF side. So there will be different choices, but the investor has to choose what is right for them. And it is more important that more choices be given to the investor because the portfolio requirements as life becomes more complicated can change. What is right for Coel is definitely not right for me because we are different ages at different stages in life. And hence, once you make the total portfolio construction, and my favorite example is the next 50, because when you look at the next 50 as a product, there is no active fund benchmark to the next 50. There is no fund there. So there is no reason why the next, and we are talking about the next 50, the next 50 not being part of anybody's portfolio. So this is how you can complement and build a better product, whether it's index or ETF, you take a choice. Okay. Uh, Koel, I wanted to ask you one question. Uh, fundamentally, who do you think is an ideal active investor and who do you think is an active passive investor? Fundamentally, I know it's a very simplistic question. It, there, uh, uh, it, you know, uh, it is a thing about risk tolerance, asset allocation. This is a lot more complicated. But other things, you know, Swaroop had hinted at it that a person who's new into the uh, investing could perhaps start with a uh, index fund. Or so what's okay. your take? So basically, an active investor would be somebody who goes into stock selection has the financial literacy to understand the market, understand how the stock is moving. Some of them, I mean, if, if they, you are somebody who has the ability to look at a trading terminal, understand how the markets are going, have the foresight on how your um, you know, risk-reward ratio investment goals are, and you're taking those active calls, that's your active strategy. Now, for a lot of us, including myself, I don't think I can have the capability to be an actor because I can't be looking at the market all the time. Even though my business, I do calculate the Sensex and we do calculate the S&P 500, but still I don't look stock by stock individually. I mean, as an index provider, I sometimes don't even know stock details. I only know the ISIN numbers or the QCIP numbers because that's, I'm just picking stocks and formula. From a passive side, I am buying a basket. Like I will buy this, I don't know much, but I know that the S&P BSC Sensex represents the Indian market. Markets. So I will say, okay, I want a piece of the Indian markets and I want to be growing and you know, investing into the Indian markets. I then invest in the S&P BSE, either index fund or ETF as, you know, they said as it suits you. If I want a geographical, you know, exposure into the international markets, incidentally, which happened last year, you know, the COVID environment really opened up the geographical boundaries. People decided that a diversification as a part of your, you know, portfolio was important. So people invested in the S&P 500 as well. In fact, uh, Swaroop, you know, also in Miriam launched the top 50 uh, S&P 500. So I think that gives you then that piece of exposure into US markets. If I don't have the expertise to understand whether I want to invest in a Google, a Microsoft, a Facebook, or an Apple, then I would say I just want to invest in the large cap in the US market, which represents that market. I want to grow or you know, differentiate with the market. Okay. And that's how it works. Okay. We are running short of time. So what I would like to have is famous last words from the three of you, your industry veterans. This is an audience which is kind of deciding to look at passives more seriously. What is your one piece of advice to them? So I think I'll just use an analogy to describe indexing, okay. uh, which I use in my retail presentations. So there's an incident in the Ramayana where Lakshman is injured and Hanumanji is sent for stock picking, Sanjeevani Bhuti. Instead of doing that, he carries the entire ETF or the index fund. Okay, so Sanjeevani, Sanjeevani Bhuti, Sanjeevani Bhuti, whether it is stock picks or manager selection is an illusion. It is like chasing rainbows. Stay passive. Stay passive. Very, very strong words, okay. So I think uh, uh, it's an interesting time in the industry uh, with the categorization of funds, the number of funds that can come from the active side are that much, while the ideation possibility on the passive side is unlimited. India has this great advantage of having the U.S. market unfold from market cap indices to now smart beta products. I back our producer, product managers to be far superior to them. Watch out for some very good products to unfold on the other side. And then don't choose between what is this or that. Don't get caught in that trap. Choose what is right for you. And then it's 
great investing in India. I have always said, uh, sell India at a risk. It's a great time to be an asset manager in India. At the same time, it's a great time to be an investor in India. And it's probably the best time to be a distributor in India. But don't get biased. Okay. We have set a mission for ourselves to be the wealth creator for every Indian. I mean, it was last year when the total number of uh, investors in India were like little over two crores, and we thought this number has to go to 20 crores over the next several years. India is creating an economic miracle which is unparalleled in human history. And maybe in the interest of time, I won't do that to explain that. But our idea is that how do we ensure that every single Indian household participate in that growth story? If that happens through active, you should surely do that because you'll make more than what the market will deliver. If you're happy with the market, that itself is going to be a very decent returns. We'll have the full bouquet of passive products as well. Thank you. Well, you know, as, as the panel discussed, you know, index options are so varied and there are so many options which cuts across, you know, geographic, thematic and, you know, a, a lot of asset class boundaries. So the options for indexing is vast and there are many, many new themes and concepts coming up. So, you know, as an advocate for passive investing, I would definitely say that, you know, look at that aspect where you get exposure into such different themes. And India has been always, you know, jump-starting and getting into newer concepts. Even like right now, there's an exponential growth in passives. So this is the time to, I think, make the most of it and take exposure to all the new themes that are coming, be it even crypto, metaverse, you know, artificial intelligence oriented indices, you have electric vehicles, et cetera, coming up. So there is so much out there that, you know, the indexing space can offer as through passives. I think this is a very, very opportunistic time. Okay. Okay, with this, we come to the end of the session. Uh, Dr. Kemani, you have a question? Okay, one, make it brief. So this question, question is for Swarup. During the COVID period last two yeah. years back, yeah. we found that the ETFs which were available were not giving the true reflection of the index at the price which it was available. True. Just now also a few days back, people who wanted to invest in the US and NASDAQ ETFs which are listed, they are going at a 10-10% premium. You spoke about liquidity and market makers and all that. That clearly isn't happening enough. See, actually, especially for the uh, US based or the global funds, what is happening right now is very unfortunate. I, I feel the personal opinion that investors cannot buy in. And I'm, I'm giving you a very shocking sort of, and this is what I'm learning over these last five, six years. We launched, say, the FANG Plus, and I'm sorry I'm giving an example. Uh, I'm not selling the fund, please. Uh, uh, I, we launched the FANG Plus, a 10 stock portfolio, equal weighted. So with my team, I was just saying that talk about the risk, talk about the risk, talk about the risk. This is what we said. Investors bought the fund. The returns of one year are gone. Typically, traditionally, I would be sitting in my office taking calls, care a boss, your product to bekar hai. What have you done with this product? Nothing of that is happening. The only call I'm getting is when can I buy the product? That speaks of the change of the risk-taking potential or the risk-taking profile of people in India. And it's so good to see that, right? Now, because there is no buyer and seller available, the liquidity is an issue. If it were an efficient market, trust me, this is not what would be. If you are saying that to our market cap indices, which are there, say the Nifty 50 or the next 50, I will take that answer. But at this moment, till it is not open for purchase, my personal opinion is it's not right to judge at this moment. It's a lopsided market against the manufacturer. So it's an aberration. Just bear with till the market opens up. After the market opens up, if these premiums are still there, then my team will be responsible. Thank you. Okay, with this, we come to the end of this session. I think let's give the panel a big hand. So, uh, you know, uh, they've given, frankly, and there were deep answers. There were no shallow this thing, and there was very little selling done. So I'm so happy. Okay, so come. Thank you. Thank you indeed to all of our panelists as well.